Hi, people. So you've probably, um, if you could deal with it, um, you may have watched the State of the Union address by the 45th president, Donald Trump. Um, it was just a bit of a, a joke, of course. And as Nancy Pelosi said, as she, teared up, as she tore up the transcript of his speech, um, people asked her later on, why did she tear it up? And she said, because it's a, quote, manifesto of mistruths, end quote. From before someone, Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, um, admitted a couple of months ago in public on a public CNN um, discussion that her um, that she knew that George W. Bush was uh, lying about uh, weapons in mass, of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, so, you know, this pot calling kettle black kind of thing, because they're all lies in some way. So um, that's the... Uh, that's just one of many lies, of course, that Speaker Nancy Pelosi would have been involved in. But that lie, knowing that she knew that George W. Bush was lying about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that she allowed that lie to continue, and that led to the deaths of over one million Iraqis and the destruction, a major, massive devastation of their country. And that's a pretty big lie, too. So, uh, yes, Donald Trump, I, I did list, watch that State of the Union address and every sentence was just manufactured nonsense and oftentimes the exact opposite of what was actually happening. And as Bernie Sanders st said later in his State of the Union, um, he, he gave a, a speech about the State of the Union by Donald Trump and basically said, yes, if you say if you count that his cronies his corporate cronies are doing extremely well then you would say that the nation is doing very well or that you would say the economy is doing well very well because uh basically the very top one percent i think they have had a 37 percent increase in their wealth and i think there's now three three people in the united states have more wealth than more than half the population. So if you're just talking, if you're talking about um, the wealth of the the club that we don't belong to, the one percent, and the upper upper one percent, then you would say that the economy is doing very well for them. Um, so there were other things that he said, and of course, I'm going to skip along and show you some little excerpts. At some point, he starts bringing in. Thousands of students remain on a waiting list. One of those students is Janiah Davis, a fourth grader from Philadelphia. Janiah. Now, this is an example of um, actually he he employed Betsy DeVos, the uh, sister of Eric Prince, who is uh, formerly of Blackwater, that private mercenary army. Now, I think they're called Academy, something like that. Betsy DeVos is all for basic um, basically charter schools and private education so expensive education mm. she's all for expensive education well that's that's who he, the education person is betsy devos so this sort of nonsense that he's now pulling out he's now exploiting black people in this black people in latin latinx people in this um speech as he does as they all do um He's using this little girl to make out as if it's almost like giveaway time. He basically gives her some sort of scholarship, exploiting certain people to make a point about why he's doing what he's doing or or just basically exploiting them. Um, the thing with Suleimani, um, he wanted to point out that how evil Suleimani, Suleimani is, even though General Suleimani was actually on his way to broker a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Iraq, and you can't have that, and that was one of the reasons he was assassinated. Another reason is he's been basically fighting ISIS, a brutal campaign against ISIS, for a very long time. And when you know much, when you know a little bit about what the U.S. imperialism um, adventures have been, what what the U.S. has been doing for um, decades. They actually really created ISIS. Even Obama basically admitted that they created a vacuum for the likes of ISIS. Uh, they supported the Mujahideen in Iraq in the 80s. And if you've read The Management of Savagery, it shows how the U.S. has basically created 
what is happening today. Here's an example of an exploitation of a little girl in the name of education. He offers her a scholarship later on. This is exploiting black people to make a point. I, I really hate the way they pick out these uh, people and uh, they're always usually black people or Latinx people and uh, they try and exploit them to make a point about how wonderful they are when they couldn't really give a toss about black people when you see all the other things that are going on in the US three black people are killed every day by the police um, mostly done com with complete impunity um, and uh, see at the below the screen there um, Juan Guaido later on they introduce Juan Guaido and Nancy Pelosi jumps to her feet and uh, in welcoming Juan Guaido and they call him the president of Venezuela even though the US backed a right-wing coup against Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela and uh, installed their own little puppet Juan Guaido and um, Juan Guaido has been inviting the military in there. The U.S. has tried to assassinate Nicolas Maduro. Um, you know, there's been 40,000 Venezuelans have died as a result of crippling U.S. sanctions, and U.S. sanctions are an act of war, and they, those 40,000 Venezuelans have died since 2017. And, Nick, and this guy, Juan Guaido, right here, who uh, Donald Trump invited and highlighted later on, He's totally fine with that because they're usually, they're not the, um, there's a class system in Venezuela and he supports the white, more light-skinned Venezuelans, the wealthy ones. And so there's a class struggle there. And at this present time, the U.S., of course, wants um, a hold of Venezuela's oil, even though uh, the U.S. is doing very well with its own oil and gas now. But they want to destroy basically any competition. So they, Venezuela's got huge amounts of oil there um, and they want to uh, move their corporations in like they do with all these other countries that won't submit to them, that are socialist-like or socialist. And um, in the case of Venezuela, they're not really socialist. They have um, a lot of private corporations there. But um, Donald Trump... Uh, is basically highlighting Juan Guaido in, in later on. And, and Nancy Pelosi jumps to her feet, and you know, which just demonstrates once again that there's very little difference between the two parties. They're both imperialist parties. They're both all fine with um, stealing resources from other countries and destroying them. And at this point, as Dan Kovalik said, who's, um, he wrote a book called The Plot, the Plot to um, Invade Iran, I think it's called, he was talking about how the U.S. now just really wants to basically destroy the competition. They're not even that interested, really, in um, anything but destroying the competition, leaving the country in a mess. And that's probably what's on the cards with Venezuela, but also allowing their corporate mates to go in there and privatize everything. Janaya's mom, Stephanie, is a single parent. She would do anything to give her daughter a better future. I mean, doesn't that make you sick? Uh, th like this this disingenuous feigning care about black people and single mothers and all of that. I mean, these people, they have absolutely no moral compass. They, they're psychopaths. They have no empathy. And every s State of the Union address, they drag out somebody. And uh, this is like, you know, a giveaway show, this particular thing. They give her a scholarship and everybody claps and this everybody's supposed to think, oh, isn't he wonderful towards black people? Isn't it wonderful what he did to, for that black, that young black child? Uh, it's, it's just disgusting. Here's an example of an exploitation of a little girl in the name of education. He offers her a scholarship later on. This is exploiting black people to make a point. Uh, he, uh, Donald Trump, hired Betsy DeVos 
who um, basically is all for charter schools and private, expensive private education. And, uh, you know, so this is sort of a nonsense. I, I really hate the way they pick out these uh, people. And uh, they're always usually black people or Latinx people. And uh, they try and exploit them to make a point about how wonderful they are when they couldn't really give a toss about black people, when you see all the other things that are going on in the US, three black people are killed every day by the police, um, mostly done com with complete impunity. Um, and uh, see at the below the screen there, um, Juan Guaido. Later on, they introduce Juan Guaido and Nancy Pelosi jumps to her feet and uh, in welcoming Juan Guaido, and they call him the president of Venezuela, even though the U.S. backed a right-wing coup against Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela and uh, installed their own little puppet, Juan Guaido. And um, Juan Guaido has been inviting the military in there. The U.S. has tried to assassinate Nic Nicolas Maduro. Um, you know, there's been 40,000 Venezuelans have died as a result of crippling U.S. sanctions, and U.S. sanctions are an act of war, and they those 40,000 Venezuelans have died since 2017. And Nick, and this guy, Juan Guaido, right here, who uh, Donald Trump invited and highlighted later on, he's totally fine with that. Because they're usually, they're not the, um, there's a class system in Venezuela, and he supports the white, more light-skinned Venezuelans, the wealthy ones. And so there's a class struggle there. And at this present time, the U.S., of course, wants um, a hold of Venezuela's oil, even though uh, the U.S. is doing very well with its own oil and gas now. But they want to destroy, basically, any competition. So they, Venezuela's got huge amounts of oil there, um, and they want to... Uh, move their corporations in like they do with all these other countries that won't submit to them that are socialist like or socialist and um in the case of venezuela they're not really socialist they have um, a lot of private corporations there but um donald trump uh is basically highlighting juan guaido in in later on and and Nancy Pelosi jumps to her feet and, you know, which just demonstrates once again that there's very little difference between the two parties. They're both imperialist parties. They're both all fine with um, stealing resources from other countries and destroying them. And at this point, as Dan Kovalik said, who's, um, he wrote a book called The Plot, the Plot to um, Invade Iran, I think it's called, he was talking about how the U.S. now just really wants to basically destroy the competition. They're not even that interested, really, in um, anything but destroying the competition, leaving the country in a mess. And that's probably what's on the cards with Venezuela, but also allowing their corporate mates to go in there and privatize everything. Janaya's mom, Stephanie, is a single parent. She would do anything to give her daughter a better future. I mean, doesn't that make you sick? Uh, th like this this disingenuous feigning care about black people and single mothers and all of that. I mean, these people, they have absolutely no moral compass. They, they're psychopaths. They have no empathy. And every S State of the Union address, they drag out somebody. And uh, this is like, you know, a giveaway show, this particular thing. They give her a scholarship and everybody claps and this everybody's supposed to think, oh, isn't he wonderful towards black people? Isn't it wonderful what he did to, for that black, that young black child? Uh, it's, it's just disgusting. Over. I can proudly announce tonight that an opportunity scholarship has become available. It's going to you and you will soon be heading to the school of your choice. I mean, how sad is that? It's sad because it's it's lovely for her, but I mean, this is just exploiting those people to make out like he cares about black people, that he cares about education for poorer people, which is a nonsense. Thank you, Melania, for your extraordinary love and profound care for America's children. Thank you very much. 
Melania, by the way, <laughs> always looks to me like she's kind of been dumped in a situation that she just has to grin and bear it. I think that woman is just hanging on by the skin of her teeth uh, getting through this presidency. She doesn't really want to be First Lady, and, and it's looking more and more like she's going to have to be First Lady for the next um, four years if the, the way the Democrats have managed to stuff up uh, with this whole Russiagate thing and also trying to sabotage Bernie Sanders as they did recently in the Iowa caucus. Um, and uh, please check out my recent video, which is a reading of the Grey Zone article about the Seth Klarman um, backs illegal Israeli, Israeli settler um, occupations of Palestinian land. He's part of a backing of the Shadow Inc. app that was used in the Iowa caucus, which um, supposedly stuffed up. And uh, he's actually backing Pete Buttigieg. So he's backing the Shadow Inc. app that was used in the Iowa caucus, and he's backing Pete Buttigieg. And Pete Buttigieg appears to be, um, you know, they're trying to make out that he won the Iowa caucus. So um, that sh sort of tells us a little bit about Pete Buttigieg and his backers. Bernie, Bernie Sanders um, actually won, really, in that uh, Iowa caucus, and yet I think he only gets the same amount of delegates. You know, this is where the American electoral system is just corrupt, and it's not democratic whatsoever. And I can see as they go along, they're going to set sabotage him at every turn and um bernie sanders i'm talking about and uh, do their best to make sure that he never gets anywhere near the nomination and that's no surprise of course but i mean they started off right from the word go now trying to sabotage him and notice uh, as i was saying about um melania i think she just is absolutely hanging on by the skin of her teeth and grinning and bearing it. I don't think that she even really is that much enamored with Donald Trump at this point. I'd be surprised if uh, it'd be interesting to see if they remain married later, but um, maybe she decides that it's more pragmatic to keep being married to him because she can make her own money just by now being first lady and going around and giving expensive speeches. Um, and look to the left of Melania and you'll see Rush Limbaugh, who recently was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Rush Limbaugh was the one of the major cheer squads for the war in Iraq, the lies that led to the war in Iraq. He's um, an incredible bigot and hate monger and has been for a long time now and making a load of money doing that kind of work. It's very profitable being a right-winger bigot these days. You can really grift and uh, do very well. And so Rush Limbaugh has made a fortune by being a hate monger and a bigot. I heard recently that he actually um, was, did he put together a little film or something of some black person scavenging in bins for food and they he put some sort of awful background music to it and he was laughing about it and making jokes and um i mean they're just he epitomizes the mean-spiritedness and the neoconservative um awfulness really of the all that is awful about there's a lot of good things about that country there's a lot of good people there but there are there is a element of mean-spiritedness and a sort of a spiritual malaise in relation to homeless people and to people who are struggling. There's been this culture of contempt that has been cultivated by the mainstream media there and by people like Rush Limbaugh. Limbaugh. I don't know how to say his name, Rush Limbaugh. And um, you'll see later, I'll see if I can find it on this thing, you, you'll see later that Donald Trump, I said, to, um, I said to my partner at the time when we were watching this, I said, I bet you Donald Trump is going to give Rush Limbaugh a Medal of Freedom. And sure enough, he gave him a Medal of Freedom right there and then on the spot and, get, and had Melania put it around him. This guy gets a Medal of Freedom for being a hate monger and a bigot. And that is, by the way, a dog whistle to the right, that this is we, that Donald Trump rewards 
uh, the, this white supremacist bigotry. Uh, and he also does a dog whistle to the right when he mentions the, the phrase America first, which is something that the uh, Ku Klux Klan used to um, use that term, America first. It's a very old white supremacist term. And when he uses that, when Donald Trump uses that term, America first, that's a dog whistle to the right. It's a dog whistle to all his to. I went to his right wing base that he still is supporting that ideology of white supremacy, and um, and when he basically once again vilifies Mexicans and um, basically you know points out some isolated crime. <coughs> excuse me, some isolated crime done by somebody from some. Uh, as he calls them, quote-unquote, illegal aliens, and uh, basically vilifies all, all sort of um, asylum seekers from, uh, from Mexico because of one person. Um, that's also dog-whistling to his base. Basically dog-whistling to his base that he um, is still going to pursue and vilify and prosecute and do everything in his power to make anybody who's fleeing the meddling that has happened by you, the U.S. in Mexico and in other Latin American countries, anybody fleeing that, they're going to then persecute them once again. And uh, then, he, then he gets somebody from ICE uh, to stand up, and that person happens to be a Latinx person. I hope I've got that term right. I'm not sure whether to call them Latino or Latinx, so please excuse me, I'm not a U.S. citizen, but he gets this Latinx um, ICE person to stand up and and sort of he praises that person. Like he basically tries to use different races against the race that he's trying to vilify or he uses and exploits the race to make a point that ends up damaging the chances of that particular race from getting education and he basically he does that over and over and over again and basically trying to pretend that he cares about diversity it's really disgusting but then again this is not isolated to donald trump donald trump is they all do it barack obama did it george w bush did it uh, bill clinton did it i mean bill clinton started the whole mass incarceration of black people so, you know, which opened up this kind of uh, legalized slavery in the, pris prisons where, in the prisons where they're actually making uh, clothes for the now defunct Dis Dis Victoria's Secret and uh, they're actually call centers using prisoners. I mean, Bill Clinton, you know, and, and you still see people. I, I was amazed somebody said, I saw the other day the first black president, Bill Clinton. I mean, it's insane. You know, that guy w w started the whole mass incarceration of black people. It, it's truly amazing how um, how propagandized the uh, many Amer U.S. citizens are about their government and about what they're doing. And if if you wa if you watch this State of the Union speech, you and you actually believed what he was saying, you would think that everything was hunky dory. And then later on, he actually vilifies uh, social. He actually vilifies socialism, even though, of course, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist; he's a democratic socialist, but. Uh, socialism isn't capitalism with a happy face, but he actually vilifies socialism later on and basically is is reassuring the public that he's going to make sure that socialism doesn't destroy the country and doesn't destroy health care. I mean, you couldn't make this up. They're not providing any free health care. If you actually had socialism, you would have free health care. And you don't have to have free health. You don't have to have socialism to have free health care. Because we have free health care here in Australia, although they're trying to, the neoliberals and neoconservatives are trying to destroy that for us. But we have free health care to some degree in Australia. Uh, and we're, we're not a socialist country. Most, uh, all Western countries except for the United States have free health care, pretty much. So, you know, I mean, but if you believed what he was saying, you would think that socialism is a problem. And capitalism is just fine, thanks very much. Even though there's hundreds of thousands of people dying through lack of health care, and there's m tens of millions of people don't have adequate health care. And health care is a right. 
I think even Obama at one point said healthcare is a right. I think Bernie Sanders actually um, had a, a political ad recently where he uses Obama's words against him because Obama did nothing really to um, help bring in Medicare for all, even though he had an opportunity to do so. But Obama even said um, healthcare is a right. So it's truly amazing the, 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 how these people tangle everything up. Anyway, there's poor Melania grinning and growing it. <laughs> it's crazy. If there was ever somebody who didn't want to... Wait a minute. If there was ever somebody that didn't want to be First Lady, I'd say it was probably her. ...administration and ironclad pledge to American families, we will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions. Well, that's a lie right there. And we will always protect your Medicare, and we will always protect your Social Security, always. Another lie, because he only said just recently something to the opposite of that. You no, know, no interest whatsoever in free health care here. No interest. And um, we might be able to get to see the bit where he's <laughs> demonizing socialism. But as we work to improve Americans' health care, there are those who want to take away your health care, take away your doctor, and abolish private insurance entirely. Sorry, I had to fasten that up. Can, if people want to continue paying private health insurance when there's free health care, they're more than welcome to do it, as far as I understand. Um, but this is this, um, this, this fear-mongering that um, Bernie Sanders is going to take away people's ability to choose their doctors. I mean, in Australia here, I get to choose whoever I want to go to. There might be some doctors now because they've tried to, um, they've been messing with the public health care system intentionally, trying to destroy it, the neoliberals and neoconservatives on either side, the major parties. Um, and so some doctors now have actually had to, they've actually had to start um, putting in um, charging, you know, say $35 or something to come and see them. Uh, that's talking about general practitioners. Um, but, but you can still, I can still go and see many doctors without... Um, paying anything and uh and so we still have you know to a some degree a free health care system and um you know there's no i don't have to go and see some bodgy doctor because i'm i'm seeing them f for free and i've worked in the um health care system as a registered nurse and um it was much better in the 80s when they weren't trying to destroy the public system. But ever since uh, Gough Whitlam was gotten rid of by the CIA, they admitted they got rid of him. He was the Prime Minister of Australia in the mid-70s. Ever since they, the CIA admitted to getting helping get rid of him, there's been a neoliberal mess ever since. So unfortunately, I've seen the healthcare system deteriorate over time because of um, the, because of neoliberals and neoconservatives trying to destroy it. But in the 80s, when it was still relatively healthy, uh, the, the healthcare system and the public hospitals were properly funded, um, it was actually, it was this myth that uh, private, private healthcare was better than public healthcare. It wasn't. And I'd say still to this day, public healthcare is still better than private health care um, in the hospitals and than a private hospital. Um, and that, I don't mean the waiting times are better. They make you wait longer, but the and that's because they're intentionally defunding public hospitals to destroy them. But the actual care itself, the quality of care, the doctors and the nurses, etc., is is very, very good. Uh, so, you know, this sort of, this is ridiculous. Anybody who does any research from the United States into what other Western countries are getting, even with all the messing that the neoliberals and neoconservatives have done here in Australia, we I still I still have like I broke my arm uh, about a week ago, and I went to the emergency department. Uh, I, I didn't have to pay a cent. They took um, X-rays. They took a number of X-rays. Um, a doctor set my arm. He. Um, put a local anesthetic in the area where I have to go and see them tomorrow to see if I need an operation. Um, but he had to sort of set the arm using a local anesthetic. I didn't need to use gas. It was fine. And uh, that never cost me anything. So that whole procedure, the x-rays, seeing the doctor and all of that never cost me a cent. Now tomorrow I have to go to 
see uh, the orthopaedic specialist and that won't cost me any money either. This is at the public hospital and the orthopaedic specialists are just fine and they'll probably do another x-ray and then they'll put, set my arm in plaster. Should I need an operation, that won't cost me any money either as far as I, you know, it won't cost me any money either in the public hospital. So basically uh, all of that for nothing and the doctors are just fine. In fact, they're as good as any doctors you would find privately. And in the 80s, we used to say it's a myth that the doctors, the, pri the private hospitals were better and that the private hospital doctors were better. In fact, the public hospital doctors were better because they were training hospitals. And uh, so they had really, really good doctors training other doctors. So all of this that I'm going to have done up until tomorrow and possibly an operation that I might require for this break that I have in my arm will all be, uh, I won't have to pay anything. for, And that's all because we have a very good um, healthcare system here. You know, it's, as I say, they're trying to destroy it, but it's still relatively free. 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our health care system, wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. Now, that's see, that that's just all lies. Um, he's obviously trying to help. He's obviously trying to do the big pharma and uh, the insurance industries some sort of favor here by fear mongering and whatever. But um, there are. I, I don't know, I think Bernie Sanders said there was like 80 million people don't have adequate health insurance. Uh, and they don't have, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, lots of people that cannot afford to go to a doctor. There is one in four Americans cannot afford to pay for their medications when they're prescribed medications from their doctor. There are people dying because they are intermittently using insulin. You can't do that. As, as a former registered nurse, I mean, you have to use insulin every day. If you do not use insulin every day, that's dire. It's dire for anybody who, who has diabetes and requires insulin. So, you know, there's no, you can't intermittently take medication. It makes it useless. And so basically, uh, if one in four Americans cannot afford to buy medication and they shouldn't have to be buying medication, then that's appalling. So, you know, here he is fear-mongering about and making out as if the private healthcare system is just fine and fear-mongering that people won't be able to see the doctors they want. Um, socialism is going to destroy the healthcare system. For goodness sake, well, I, I can give you um, first-hand experience that being a health professional and also being an Australian citizen in a relatively free healthcare system that... It is definitely a relief. When I broke my arm, if I had lived in the United States, I'd be in debt now. Who knows how much? And then if I'd had an operation, I could have been tens of thousands of dollars in debt. I mean, it's frightening. And I hope that this never happens to us here. But they're trying to make this happen to us here. Uh, but this is, you know, I would be in debt now. And I would probably already be in debt because obviously there are times where you do hurt yourself and you have to go to the emergency department or you're not healthy, you, something happens and you need to see a doctor. So everybody at some point is going to be accruing debt if there's not a Medicare for all system, a single payer system, as they call it in the United States, universal health care. Health care is a right. To those watching at home tonight, I want you to know we will never let socialism destroy American health care. Oh, yay. <laughs> Don't you love that? I think he said that last time, too. He, he basically said, you know, the whole fear-mongering about socialism. It's just, it's just amazing. And everybody jumps to their feet because there's all these business owners and there's all these corporations. They, they want to make money. They're like vultures and no offense to vultures, they're like vultures with the public. They want to pick the bones of every single American there is there, and they don't want anybody to be healthy. They want people to be sick so that they go to doctors and they pay an arm and a leg, literally, to see doctors, and um, there's a huge amount of money to be made from a sick population. And that's one more reason for people to become vegan, because um, we'd be a lot healthier if you see the movie, uh, the, the documentary, What the Health, you'll understand what I'm talking about. 
um, we'd be a lot healthier and we wouldn't need to be seeing doctors as much. But um, this is just another example of the, the fear. It, this just shows the fear that these corporatists, the Democrats and the GOP, these corporate um, loving, serving uh, politicians, they're all fearful that they're going to lose their lobbyist money because, because the country is going to eventually have free health care. Over 130 legislators in this chamber have endorsed legislation that would bankrupt our nation by providing free taxpayer-funded health care to millions of illegal aliens, forcing tax... By the way, this tax-funded... If you know anything about a sovereign economy, federal taxes do not fund spending, and all you have to do is look at Dr. Stephanie Kelton, who is Bernie Sanders' economic advisor, and see what she has said about the deficit, about uh, student debt elimination, about... Um, federal taxes, not funding spending, um, about a federal job guarantee versus a UBI, all of that. Bernie Sanders' economic advisor, Stephanie Kelton, he was, she was his economic advisor in 2016, and now she is her economic advisor in 2020. But, um, Stephanie Kelton is a pr proponent of MMT, and MMT is simply a description of the operational reality of a sovereign economy. So Stephanie Kelton knows all about how easy it is for the government to fund Medicare for all, to eliminate student debt, to have a federal federal job guarantee versus a UBI, because UBI is a neoliberal scam. Uh, she's very well versed in explaining why federal taxes do not fund spending. So all these programs that they're carrying on about that are, that are, are due to taxes, federal taxes, is a nonsense. Nobody has to pay federal taxes um, their, their federal taxes are not funding any of these programs for people. So to find out what more about what that means, go and check out Stephanie Kelton's numerous videos on YouTube, which explain how the sovereign economy functions and how it is very easy. The only constraints are resources. It's very easy for a sovereign economy to fund uh, Medicare for all. And you'll never hear them say, how are you going to pay for it when it comes to, say, for example, the 735 billion dollars, billion with a B dollars that they um, funded the, with the military. Um, it was a military funding that they um, recently approved. The Democrats approved it, by the way, even though they keep on carrying on about how uh, Donald Trump is a Manchurian candidate and that Putin is pulling the strings, etc. And yet they still happily find the money very easily. You'll never hear them say, we need to raise taxes to fund these huge military budgets, one of the biggest military budgets ever. Um, you'll never hear them say that because the sovereign economy can afford to, it can, can afford those sort of things, which is really unfortunate, but it can afford that and it can afford free health care. Um, and the things that the these politicians who are owned by corporations and by the military industrial complex will always defer to funding the military for the imperialist adventures of the US, but they will always do their best to not give the public what they deserve, even though 75%, I think, of the public, or is it 85%, want medi free health care, want Medicare for all. They just ignore what the public want and do whatever they can. But you will never hear them ever say, how are you going to pay for that? How are you going to pay for that military fund, uh, spending? You'll never hear that. That's because, um, they could, that's because they can do exactly the same thing for Medicare for all, funding it. And uh, in a sovereign economy, the only constraints are resources. And the deficit is nothing to be afraid of. If you bring a deficit into a surplus, you actually cause a recession. These are all things that we need to understand. I'm not one, the one to be explaining it. You really need to watch Stephanie Kelton or tune into um, uh, tune yeah tune into Dr. Stephanie Kelton's talks. There's many on YouTube, and find out how the sovereign economy works. And then you can really understand why they never ever ask. How are you going to pay for it when it comes to military spending? But they're always carrying on about how are you going to pay for it when it comes to um, Medicare for all? It's because they choose to do one and they refuse to do the other because they're bought by corporations in the military industrial complex. ...to subsidize free care for anyone in the world who unlawfully crosses our borders. These proposals would raid the Medicare benefits of our seniors and that our seniors depend on while acting as a powerful lure for illegal immigration. That is what is happening in California. That's a lie. Anyway, um, I'm going to move along. Almost every American family knows the pain 
when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by millions of Americans, who just received a stage four advanced cancer diagnosis. This is not good news, but what is good news is that he is the greatest fighter and winner that you will ever meet. Rush Limbaugh, thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. And as I mentioned before, Rush Limbaugh was one of the greatest cheerleaders of um, getting us into the war in Iraq. And he is also an incredible bigot. Um, the hate that spews out of his mouth about various disenfranchised groups, about the homeless, about black people, about trans people, about um, the LGBT um, I community in general, uh, just all disenfranchised groups. He has contempt and he's a white supremacist. And this is what Donald Trump has done, has given him a Medal of Freedom, the highest uh, civilian honor you can get, all for being an incredible bigot. And that's what I mean by a dog whistle to the right. And Rush, in recognition of all that you have done for our nation, the millions of people a day that you speak to and that you inspire, and all of the incredible work that you have done for charity. I am proud to announce tonight that you will be receiving our country's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. the First Lady of the United States to present you with the honor, please. Have you ever seen anything so ridiculous? And next, um, mind you, most of the people that have received that honor, a lot of them are war criminals. So I suppose in some ways it goes in keeping. But not everybody that has been a war criminal has received that medal of honor. I mean, Joe Biden received that, I think. But isn't it appalling? This hate, hateful bigot. <laughs> Seriously. You know? Look at him. And he's loaded with money, too. Rush and Catherine, congratulations. Thank you, Catherine. So there you go. That's how they like to uh, throw their medals around. Giving it to bigots and war, war criminals and hate mongers. Before I came into office, if you showed up illegally on our southern border and were arrested, you were simply released and allowed into our country, never to be seen again. My administration has ended catch and release. Catch and release, that sounds like, you know, catching f fish and then releasing them. I mean, the way, and by the way, I'm vegan, so I don't uh, view... Uh, sentient non-humans as lesser or as lesser than humans but it, this this in the minds of somebody whose species and also racist catch and release you know it's an awful awful term and the way he proceeds to vilify people from that are simply seeking asylum from the terrible meddling that the u.s has done and then the the following subsequent disaster that happens usually by the installation of right-wing governments and the neoliberal mess that's made thereafter, these people are actually often fleeing dread a situation that's so dreadful that they're willing to endure uh, the they're willing to endure endure the terrible racist ICE police, the ICE uh, officers that are on the border there who who basically empty out um, containers of water that are left for them by various groups that are trying to help. Uh, asylum seekers as they're coming across these treacherous, the treacherous desert into the United States, and many of them die of thirst. And the ICE, ICE officers actually tip out these containers of water, or they add add things into them. Um, you know, it's it's a, the, to to make sure that people are frightened to, to drink out of them. There, there is a it's this ICE should be abolished, and it's it's sort of like almost like. A brown shirt sort of an operation and they're only going to get worse if Trump gets in again which is likely they're only going to get more and more 
uh, racist and more and more punitive and um I mean, you only have to see what they're doing to children, putting them in detention, uh, and children dying in detention, uh, you know, these asylum seeker children. So, you know, it's it's sort of moving in further and further towards authoritarianism, towards fascism, and if Trump gets in again, it's going to be a nightmare. It, he'll see that as a mandate and he won't need to please his base anymore. He can start a war with Iran, even though he said he 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 can at, at this point say he hasn't started any new wars. He's escalated wars and and caused a lot more carnage, uh, but he hasn't actually started a new war. But he's itching to please his donor, Sheldon Adelson, who is um, always wanted. He's had the um, Iran in the crosshairs. Um, He's itching to to please his donor, Sheldon Adelson, and also the Israeli lobby, the APAC, to start a war with Iran and destroy Iran. And I'd say that's probably going to happen after he's elected, straight after probably, because he loves to do things in the new year. He loves to try and threaten countries or try and start wars in the new year. So I, I personally anticipate that there's going to be an invasion of Iran um, at in the beginning of next year, but you know, never know. He might do that before. But I'd I'd say he's wanting to please his base and say he's able to say to them, "I haven't started any new wars." But this he's this is where he uses that particular Latinx person, who's an ICE officer, to um, make a point about and to to back up his racist um, position about asylum seekers. If you come illegally, you will now be promptly removed from our country. Now we must embrace the next frontier, America's manifest destiny in the stars. I am asking Congress to fully fund the Artemis program to ensure that the next man and the first woman on the moon will be American astronauts using this as a launching pad to ensure that America is the first nation to plant its flag on Mars. So the U.S. want to, with their Star Wars, their Star Force, they're um, just an excuse to have Lockheed Martin and Northrop and all those different um, weapons manufacturers and uh, Boeing, etc., to just give them more reason to create more weapons and to create, uh, you know, sh um, spaceships or whatever. This is just a handout to those those companies, um, but also just more American imperialism. Here we go, the American exceptionalism, American imperialism, out going out into space, planting a flag on Mars and saying Mars is ours, um, and whatever other planets we would manage to get to, which, by the way, is not going to happen. Um, they're never going to make it to Mars because we can't even have a, bi a functioning biosphere here on planet Earth where people can live in a biosphere and um, grow their own food and exist without it failing. It, it hasn't worked on this planet. And uh, so it's going to be even more difficult on Mars so I don't even, they haven't even really tried to even work out how they're going to actually set up any civilization on Mars. Um, so, you know, this whole, and also the fact that we're running out of resources and climate crisis is so dire that um, we're not ever going to make it there. It, this will take a long time to actually have any sort of success in that regard. And we, we don't have that much time left. We have probably two or three decades left before the shit really hits the fan badly. I'm talking really badly. It's already hitting the fan, but it's going to be in three decades. I think things are going to be where we're basically, um, there's lots of people starving and the climate is going to be so unpredictable. We won't be able to grow um, food properly. There'll be all sorts of um, crazy wild weather patterns, more and more fires here in Australia. I don't even know if, how Australia is going to be in five years time, let alone in 30 years time. Um, so, you know, th this, these people are in their hubris, don't even think that they, they, they have such short term vision and they're so um, arrogant and sort of psychopathic. They don't even realize that it's all coming to an end and they don't, they, some of these people will actually witness the end um, of the end of uh, our species because 
there are people that are actually younger than I am, I think, that are, uh, think that they're going to go on to the end of the century when the climate crisis is, is going to be dire in the middle of this century. And the least of their worries is Manhattan going underwater. You know, we're talking about starvation and we're talking about prolonged droughts and prolonged floods and crazy hailstorms and locusts, uh, plagues, all sorts of things. There's, there's all sorts of things happening right now. So anyway, um, this whole idea of American imperialism going out into space and them basically deciding that Mars is theirs because they get their first and planted flag. Holy crap, you know, this is how far gone. I mean, this is why we're coming to an end because we basically got one of the greatest threats to world peace today, the US empire, running the show and nobody can stop them. Really, nobody can stop them. The only country that has the ability to stop them and that would end life on Earth is probably Russia because they have nuclear parity to the United States. But that's probably the only country that could stop them, but that would also end life on the planet. But nobody can stop them. And the UN, no, nobody, they can, the UN can say that's what, what you're doing is wrong sometimes and other times they're totally on board with US imperialism, it seems. But nobody can stop them. So it's like they're just going on unabated and doing whatever the hell they want because they can, basically. So, strongly defending our national security and combating radical Islamic terrorism. See, here we go. Now we've got to vilify the Muslims. Vilify the um, Mexicans and vilify the Muslims. And uh, even though, of course, the United States, as I've said, if you read the management of savagery, demonstrates very, very clearly that they set up the Mujahideen and uh, supported them in Iraq in the 80s. And it's been a downhill slide from there. They've actually created a vacuum for ISIS. They basically have supported terrorism and ISIS and to help them, uh, you know, to overthrow governments like in Syria. I mean... There's even been admissions that they've um, supported ISIS. And in fact, right now they're helping um, ISIS get across into Iraq again to destabilize Iraq so that the U.S. doesn't have to leave. The Iraqi parliament has wanted, has decided that the U.S. must leave. And uh, there's been intelligence reports, um, intelligence reports from Iran that there are uh, the U.S. is actually transporting by Chinook helicopter, heli helicopters, ISIS across back into Iraq. I mean, they, they use ISIS. They literally use them to help destabilize countries. Notice how Israel never has any problem with ISIS. That's because Israel has a, a very, very close allyship with uh, the United States, and so does Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia really doesn't have any problems with ISIS either, and that's because of that same... I mean, that should tell us something. In fact, there was one point ISIS actually um, accidentally bombed something in, in, in Israel and apologized to Israel for that. So, I mean, that gives you a little clue about, you know, what's going on there. Gonna, I'm not going to uh, go through the whole speech, but just to give you an indication, this is where they vilify the very people, you know, the Muslims, and make out as if ISIS is some sort of Muslim thing, when really it's Wahhabism, which is basically um, a, a, an extreme, distorted view, uh, distorted position of Islam, which most Muslims reject. It's, it's a bit like, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church and the evangelical, evangelical Christians there. Most Christians would reject uh, the position of these right-wing evangelical hate-mongering Christians. And I put Christians in quotes. You know, that, that's not Christianity. And what Wahhabist um, Salafists do, uh, the, you know, they're often they haven't got a clue about what's in the Quran, for one thing. And they're totally rejects by most Muslims, just in the same way that uh, a lot of Christians reject what um, the Westboro Baptist Church does or any of these other right-wing uh, hate-mongering Christ so-called Christians do. Last week I announced a groundbreaking plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Recognizing that all past attempts have failed, we must be determined and creative in order to stabilize... 
revitalize the region and give millions of young people the chance to realize a better future. The old deal of the century where Palestinians weren't even invited to have a say in their own future. I mean, holy crap. I'm not even going to go into that, but I've posted a couple of videos about that awful deal of the century, which is just basically um, endorsing apartheid. It's basically institutionalizing apartheid. It's in, it's giving an okay to it. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> the the less said about it here, the better. But you can, you can check out the gray zone and find out about that or uh, um, the Middle East Monitor, I think, has done some things on it. If you go to independent news, meet independent journalists, you can find out something about that awful deal of the century. You know, he goes on and on and vilifying, and he ends up vilifying Soleimani, as I mentioned, I think, earlier. Um, even though Soleimani is actually, as I mentioned earlier, he I think I mentioned it earlier, that he was, um, he had a very brutal campaign against ISIS. So he's actually one of the main people who was um, trying to end ISIS. And here's uh, Donald Trump talking about how wonderful it was that they killed him. Uh, and also he was trying to broker a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iraq, a peace deal. So they wanted to get rid of him as well because of that. Um, so basically Soleimani was actually one of the major fighters against ISIS. And just earlier, Donald Trump is talking about how, um, how the United States has gotten rid of ISIS. Uh, which is a nonsense. It's actually Russia and uh, some other allies and uh, Soleimani who have helped um, prevent ISIS from taking over Syria. But then he goes and celebrates the the assassination, inter internationally law-breaking assassination of Soleimani by the U.S., even though Soleimani was one of the major uh, fighters against ISIS. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. As we defend American lives, we are working to end America's wars in the Middle East. In Afghanistan, the determination and valor of our warfighters has allowed us to make tremendous progress and peace talks are now underway. I am not looking to kill hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan, many of them totally innocent. It is also not our function to serve other nations as law enforcement agencies. These are warfighters. So basically, um, the Afghanistan wants um, the United States to get the hell out and the Taliban wants them to take those two bases that they want to keep in Afghanistan and get out, but the U.S. doesn't want to remove the two bases in Afghanistan, and that's what's held up this peace process um, in Afghanistan. And the reason also why they want to take out troops from Afghanistan is because they want to use those troops, the Pentagon wants to use those troops for its coming war on China, but also um, the possible war with Iran, which, by the way, if they undertake that war with Iran, is going to be one of the most bloodthirsty blood-soaked um, things that one could ever witness. I mean, basically, there's going to be a lot of Americans die and a lot of people in Iran and elsewhere die because so many forces, so many countries are going to come to Iran's defense. So if he is, ends up being stupid enough to go ahead with that, which it looks like he will, then it's going to be the biggest clusterfuck ever, ever undertaken by U.S. empire and could actually end, end that empire, really, because... Iran is not Iraq. Iran is not Afghani Afghanistan. Iran is a major, major force. It has many, many countries that will come to its defense. And it has like 80 million people there. Um, there are, there, it, it will be such a massive mistake to undertake that. And yet I think Donald Trump is going to be stupid enough to go ahead and do that. Fighters that we have, the best in the world, and they either want to fight to win or not fight at all. We are working to finally end America's longest war and bring our troops back home. War places a heavy burden on our nation's extraordinary military families, especially spouses like Amy Williams from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and her two children, six-year-old Eliana and three-year-old Rowan. And here's where they, once again, every State of the Union address, no matter who's in office, uh, they always exploit some situation with some soldier so that they can continue on with this myth of the amazing soldier, the warrior, so that it, it's a good recruitment tool for anybody watching because they see this kind of heroicizing, uh, this sort of um, worshipping of American soldiers. And yet, of course, when American soldiers come home and they um, require help, 
uh, physical or psychological, they're really mostly abandoned. And a lot of homeless people are veterans. And a lot of peop um, 22 veterans kill themselves every single day because they cannot cope with what they've been doing overseas or they cannot cope with their injuries or uh, they cannot cope with the PTSD, all those different things. And basically, once, the, once they've been used as cannon fodder, the US government doesn't care, just like they didn't care about the... Um, the emergency responders to 9-11. At the time, they were praising them, but then they wouldn't actually give them any um, health care to support them because most of them actually got these terrible illnesses from the asbestos and all the different chemicals that were at, the, at ground zero. So basically, it's just um, empty words when they, when, they, um, make, when they raise these people up as heroes and then they abandon them when, they, when these people need them when these soldiers or first responders need them. So um, here's an example of here's an example of Donald Trump, uh, just like every other American president, using exploiting a particular soldier and, uh, you know, this, oh, isn't that sweet? And, oh, aren't they lovely? What a wholesome family. And uh, he's come back from Afghanistan. Uh, you know, isn't he a hero and all this kind of stuff. It's This is just a recruitment tool, just like um, the Super Bowl is a recruitment tool for the military with all the um, pledging allegiance and the military planes flying over and all of that. The military is constantly trying to recruit. They're even trying to recruit now on... Um, gaming services like Twitch. They have U.S. recruiting, um, military recruiting people on there, trying to recruit young young um, children on there who are playing game, who, who are gaming on Twitch. So, you know, this is just another example of recruitment and, you know, doing this whole, um, isn't the military wonderful, aren't they heroes? Amy works full-time and volunteers countless hours helping other military families. I've got this on fast forward, by the way. Her husband, Sergeant First Class Townsend Williams, is in Afghanistan on his fourth deployment in the Middle East. Amy's kids haven't seen their father's face in many months. Amy, your family sacrifice makes it possible for all of our families to live in safety and in peace. And see... This nonsense that somehow them being in, you know, the military being in, in, in Afghanistan um, makes us all safer. How? What are they even doing there? They're just a brutal occupying force. See, see the whole question of why all these, why um, the U.S. is in Iraq, why are they in Afghanistan, why are they in Syria, and on and on, all these questions that are never asked by the corporate-owned mainstream media, it's never ever questioned. It's like, they're not protecting anybody. They're actually occupying, brutally occupying people there and destroying that country. And here we have this ridiculous notion that somehow these soldiers are um, protecting their freedoms and keeping Americans safe. That is the absolute opposite. The absolute opposite is true. And we want to thank you. Thank you, Amy. See, this is just a big exploitation of these, this mother and her children. Look at that Christian fascist at the background there, Mike Pence. But Amy, there is one more thing. Tonight we have a very special surprise. I am thrilled to inform you... See, this is like a giveaway. This is like a game show giveaway. You know, giving away a scholarship to that young black girl and um, giving a, a, a Medal of Freedom to a hateful bigot like Rush Limbaugh, giving, um, praising a Latin, Latinx ICE officer, what, for for persecuting and um, and... and and committing violence on his own, his own people, um, who are fleeing American imperialism in Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America. I mean, it, it is perverse, and this is another perversion of um, you know exploiting this family to, as, a, as a, a tool for recruiting for war. That your husband is back from deployment. He is here with us tonight, and we couldn't keep him waiting any longer. It's just sad. Cannon fodder. These people are just cannon fodder. And then they're turning other poor people into killing families and massacring whole villages and bombing countries of poor people. This is all this is. So exploiting these people, exploiting, uh, you know, to, to recruit for war. It's disgusting. Look at them. 
Jeez Louise. USA, here we go. USA, seriously. The greatest threat to world peace today, the US Empire. USA, USA. What the hell does that Welcome even home, mean? Sergeant Williams, thank you very much. Jeez Louise. As the world bears witness tonight, America is a land of heroes. There's a place where great... And here we go with the American exceptionalist bullshit. By the way, um, check out the book by Danny Haifong. Uh, he's from the Black Agenda Report, and he's written a really excellent book called American Exceptionalism, American Innocence. Um, it's, it's got a long title, but you can, you can find it. And also check out The Management of Savagery by Max Blumenthal. Both those books give you great insight into American imperialism and American exceptionalism um, and how we are where we are today. So, um, but he's going to now go into a whole lot of American exceptionalist bullshit that only an idiot, sorry, only idiots would, or people that are completely uninformed would believe at this point. This is born, where destinies are forged and where legends come to life. This is the home of Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt, of many great generals, including Washington, Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur. This is the home of Abraham. Yes, Washington, who used to steal land from uh, indigenous people and then uh, sell it. That's Washington and Pat and MacArthur. Well, we all know about MacArthur. Um, the the people, the, the names that he lists off and throwing Harriet Tubman in there somewhere. Oh, my God. It's a nightmare. And he mentions the Alamo at some point. Oh, geez. You know, it's this guy, half the time, he doesn't even know what he's talking about. If you actually question him about anything, I'd probably have more of a clue. And I'm not even a U.S. citizen. Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Harriet Tubman, the Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, and so many more. This is the country where children learn names like Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett. Wyatt Earp and Davy Crockett. Holy crap. And Andy Oakley. This is the place where the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth and where Texas Patriots made their... Yeah, this is the place where the Pilgrims landed and then d proceeded to do a genocide on the indigenous people. Last stand at the Alamo. <laughs> Last stand at the Alamo. Oh, wow. The beautiful, beautiful Alamo. The American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk. Not even a mention of indigenous people, by the way. On the face of the earth, our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canal. Who was on drugs when they wrote this speech? Seriously. Else raised up the skyscrapers, and ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before. We just need a few arms stretched out and some little um, lightning bolts on their arms. That's all we need now. Look at all the white old men there. Fantastic. This is our glorious and magnificent inheritance. We are Americans. We are pioneers. We are the pathfinders. <laughs> we settled the new world. We built the modern world. And we changed. We settled the new world? Really? Change history forever by embracing the eternal truth that everyone is made equal by the hand of Almighty God. This whole, this, everybody in that room, like, uh, who's that comedian? Oh, God. His name escapes me. Um, said, you know, it's, it's a club and you're not in it. We're not in it. This is a club. Nancy Pelosi, all those people in the room. It's just one big club and we're not in it. They're, they're all lining their own pockets in one way or another. They, um, a lot of them are all over the place in their positions, even the ones that so-called call themselves progressive. Um, it's very, very rare that anybody is morally consistent uh, when they arrive in that uh, in Congress or whatever, or after they've been there a while. America is the place where anything can happen. America is the place where anyone can rise. And here... See, that that's just complete and utter nonsense, what he just said. Utter nonsense. On this land, on this soil, on this continent, the most incredible dreams come true. 
This nation is our canvas, and this country is our masterpiece. We look at tomorrow and see unlimited frontiers just waiting to be explored. Our brightest discoveries are not yet known. Our most thrilling stories are not yet told. Our grandest journeys are not yet made. The American age, the American epic. See, this is just a campaign speech, basically. His his re-election speech, um, you know, he wants people to believe that everything is wonderful. I mean, if you listen to this whole speech, you would think everything is just hunky-dory, everything is wonderful, everything is going great for everybody, um, that everybody should be full of, everybody should be full of hope, uh, that, that the best, and he basically says the best is yet to come. Really? And and he, and he's actually undoing all, he's actually going the other direction in relation to the climate crisis and undoing all the, uh, envir- any v- environmental protections that are left. He's also, um, he's also put in uh, about 187 judges, all right-wing judges. I think a lot of them are lifetime appointments, and they're all going to make sure that anything that he wants is put through. I mean, it's scary. It's scary what's coming. Uh, If he gets in again, which is likely, he's going to see that as a mandate, and it's going to be, it's going to head towards fascism and overdrive, and I think he's even going to start putting journalists, independent journalists in prison, and possibly even the ones that have been giving him a hard time with this invention of Russiagate, um, which of course is more nuanced than I'm making out, but basically a lot of it is based on trying to cover up Hillary Clinton's corruption through the pedestrian emails that were released by WikiLeaks, and they invented um, the whole Putin is uh, controlling everything and Russia is interfering in the elections and so forth to cover up that. Um, you know, but once, so, you know, he's likely to actually start taking it out on those journalists too. And of course, um, if he gets in again, uh, Julian Assange by that stage will probably be in the United States and we'll never hear from him again. And he'll be put into a situation which is called um, MA, I think it's called SAM special. It's a sort of a, a basic extreme, I can't remember the actual term again. Sorry, I did a video on it uh, two or three Uh, videos ago and it's a basically extreme isolation where you don't get any sort of you basically get no human contact whatsoever and he'll be thrown away in a prison for 175 years which is basically a death sentence under an old outdated espionage act and uh, he'll never ever really get any sort of human contact again Uh, i don't think he's even going to make it to the united states uh, for you know under that extradition um because he'll be he'll be too sick and uh, he'll die either before he gets there or after, shortly after he gets there. But that will happen under um, Donald Trump as well. It would have happened under whomever got in, really, because um, Julian Assange basically embarrassed the U.S. empire, and that's unforgivable. The American adventure has only just begun. Our spirit is still young. The sun is still rising. God's grace is still shining. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you very much. Okay, so you saw Nancy Pelosi tear up Donald Trump's speech. You know, sort of, she probably always intended to do that. And then she says later that it was because it was a manifesto of mistruths. And I pointed out that Nancy Pelosi knew that, you know, Iraq, uh, the Iraq war was a lot, the weapons of mass destruction didn't exist. She knew George W. Bush was lying, and yet she allowed that to go on. And uh, and then we have a million Iraqi plus um, civilians dead. And so, you know, pot calling kettle black, basically. So as I, as I say, they're all, they're all criminals, crooks and liars, war criminals. And, uh, you know, if ever there were a bunch of people that need to be put in prison... <laughs> It's most of the people that are in that audience right there. Most of those people who allow this criminality to continue, who allow these wars to continue, who allow corporations to kill people through, uh, through these awful laws. Um, that's, that's sort of who needs to go to prison, most of the people in that audience. So that's where up is down and black is white. That's where we are now in the world today. So anyway, um, that's all I really wanted to say. I missed the bit about Juan Guaido. She she jumps, Nancy Pelosi jumps out of her seat to welcome Juan Guaido. The um, the the US back coup um, 
the person they installed in Venezuela and the U.S. backed that coup. Uh, he's, he self-appointed himself as president, and, and Nancy Pelosi's totally fine with that. So there we have it, um, the greatest threat to world peace today, the U.S. empire, and all the people that help enable that empire are right there in that room. Anyway, thanks for watching. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals and Vega. Please click the like button if you like the content. Please click the notifications bell. Otherwise, you won't, see, won't receive notifications when I drop a video. And um, thanks so much for watching. Till next time. Bye for now.